Well, welcome everyone to the A to B on A to Z on A to B. I keep doing that. Uh, I'm glad that you guys were all able to come tonight and to find out a little bit more about the Annapolis to Bermuda Ocean Race. We are just starting our next two year cycle with uh, all of our seminars. And this is our first of many, many more seminars to come. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be speaking first on a little bit about the race, a little background of the race, and some of the things you need to know, dates, planning, uh, things, logistics that you need to think about. And then after my, uh, my short uh, presentation, uh, Don Snellgrove is going to be doing a pretty in-depth review of the safety features for the uh, A to B race. Things that you need to think about as far as getting your boat ready and being compliant with the safety requirements for the race. The, um, the Zoom meeting we have tonight is not set up with chat, so please jot down your questions. And at the end of the presentation, after, after Don's uh, safety brief, we will um, we'll try to answer all, all of your questions um, about you know, that come up throughout the seminar. So let's get going. Uh, let's see here. This is just a little bit about the, the, um, the Annapolis to Bermuda Ocean Race. Our title sponsor is Mustang Survival. So uh, we've got um, a, our, our race has been going on for uh, since 1979. We, it is 753 miles. Uh, so it's a good five to seven day, unless of course you're you know, a super fast boat, it's five to seven days. Uh, down the bay and across the um, Gulf Stream over to Bermuda. Um, it, the, the great part about this race is that it combines both the, um, the bay racing, which many of us are very used to doing, with some offshore challenges. Uh, so it, it's sort of two races in one. You first got to get out of the bay and then you've got to get across the Gulf Stream over to Bermuda. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of challenges, um, a lot of challenges. Uh, in this race, and um, we try to make our race accessible to many different types of, of, of sailors. Uh, so if you're somebody who just do, does a lot of cruising, it, we do have classes and options for you as far as uh, a, a division for, for cruising uh, cruisers. We also have um, many different types of rating systems. So if you're wondering, you know, is this something I could do? Many people do this. Uh, it's we've had uh, catamarans. We've had we had a schooner registered in the last for the last race. So it, it is a pretty diverse group of boats on that start line. Um, it is a bucket list item for many racers. But the thing that's kind of funny is that it starts off as a bucket list race, and many racers return every two years to do it again because every ex every time you do it, it's a different experience. Um, our host in Bermuda is the Royal Hamilton Amateur Dinghy Club, and it's a fantastic venue. They're right on the harbor in, in, in Hamilton. Um, it's kind of in the center of everything. So uh, we are very excited about uh, the race coming up uh, in 2022. Um, <clears throat> I put together sort of a, just a really broad planning timeline. This certainly doesn't, it's not all inclusive. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea between now and next June what you should be doing. And I broke it out into appro to approximately four month segments. So every four months you sort of have a different focus. Um, with the first segment being between now and May, when most of us are having our boats either go back in the water or we're starting to commission them for the summer, <clears throat> uh, you should be starting to do those, those to-do checklists. Uh, every skipper I've raced with has many lists, lists after list after list. Anything that pops into your mind to do, you should go ahead and put it on a list. Uh, I was ra I raced with a skipper a few years ago who um, was feeling very overwhelmed by you know getting her getting getting the boat ready for the race until they sit they sat down and put everything on a list and said you know I'm going to get this out of my head onto paper once everything got on the list, then it was easy to say, okay, crew, what are you gonna do? How, how are we gonna do this? Let's, let's each take some of these tasks and, and knock it out. Um, certainly doing your boat repairs and doing a gap analysis. Look at, look at the, the SCRs from the 2020 race 
see where your boat is. See, see how much of, of those, those uh, safety requirements you can, how many of those you can check off now and say, yeah, my boat's ready. Um, things that you're not sure about what to do or how to do them, this is the time to really start asking those questions and reach out to the safety chair, reach out to me, reach out to people on the committee to get some answers so that you can figure out, can I do this? This is something that you know, I need to, to um, address. And then also plan a lot of distance racing, uh, even some distance cruising. Uh, you can sort of make up a race if you need to and just do a shakedown with your crew. Uh, vet, vet those people um, that you've maybe been racing with locally or maybe you've done a few distance races with those people. See how they all kind of work together. Um, the second, the next um, piece is the summer is when we're all out sailing between June, June and October. Work through your checklist. Certainly June 1st of 2021, the A to B registration entries will open. Register for the race. Go ahead and enter the race before the end of the year so you know you're on the list. We will be having some benefits to those people who are signed up for the race. There are going to be some skippers only events. There's going to be uh, some promotions that are done by our, um, our sponsors. And so you want to be, make sure that you're on the list to, to do the race. Um, vet your crew, troubleshoot your boat issues, um, sail, 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 sail the summer. The more you sail, the more you find out about your crew, about yourself, about your boat. Um, don't wait, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get a new chart plotter, don't wait until next year, next spring to get that chart plotter and try to put it in, install it before the race. Get it this summer, use it. Make sure that you're checking every system. Um, between November and February, you're of course going to continue to work the checklist. Um, that's when you really start to, to put those pieces, those, uh, the planning pieces in place for your, um, for the, the race. So, uh, res make, re making reservations for accommodations in Bermuda, making your dockage reservation at Raddick, um, securing your crew. People are getting crew between November and February. Uh, yes, March and April, people do come on board, you know, getting crew and that sort of thing. But you want to try to get your crew figured out between November and February. So uh, you can start kind of putting them to work and helping you get ready. Uh, once we get into March and April and the, the boats start to, to go back in the water and you're, you're looking at all the things you've got to get done before the race, you want to have that crew in place so you can say, Hey guys, we're gonna have a crew day. We're gonna have a work day. Come over to the boat. Help me get this ready. Um, you also need to think about your return from Bermuda. It's everyone focuses on the race, but there's actually an you've got to you've got to go the 753 miles back <laughs> to Annapolis at some point. So you're gonna to need to have people who are gonna are willing to return your boat as well. Um, CPR first aid training. We do require CPR first aid training for our um, for a percentage of the crew. So you'll want to think about getting you know, seeing who on your crew is CPR first aid trained, who needs it, and then of course do the sale inventory and order new sales. Uh, it's not advised to wait until April to order new sales if you need them for the Bermuda race because uh, you, you may not get them in time. So. If you need new sales, you'll figure that out this summer, but really <clears throat> beginning in the fall and, and in the winter next year is when you wanna think about those sales, those new sales and doing sale repairs. And then the last piece, the last four months is gonna be um, working your checklist, uh, safety at sea. We do require that um, a percentage of the crew uh, have safety at sea training. So that's something that you'll want to look at. That training is good for five years, but uh, it, it, and we do anticipate next year, they will be, um, uh, Maritime Trades will be holding the safety at sea training. Um, completing your entries paperwork. There's a lot of, because we are an international um, race, there is a lot of paperwork that has to happen. A lot of things that the entries chair is gonna need from every boat. So completing all that paperwork and communicating with uh, Vickery is going to be very key. Um, finishing your boat and then also practicing. Um, I always tell people that the best shakedowns are those that you do in really crappy weather. If it's gonna be blowing, it's if it's gonna be raining, if it's not going to, or 
conversely, if there's no wind, it's that's the best time to get your, your crew together and get out there. Do night, do a night sail, do some night, uh, a destination sail overnight to kind of get an idea of how people work together. And uh, it's, you know, it's a different type of sailing if you're sailing at night. Um, <clears throat> I included the, this slide in here, this accommodations in Bermuda, because I mentioned it on the previous slide. I know it seems really early, but um, we do compete for properties with the, Annap the, I'm sorry, the Newport to Bermuda race. And even though they don't happen at the same, theirs is two weeks after ours, a lot of the properties that are available will rent out their property for a week during uh, June when the races are in town. So if a property is booked for the Newport to Bermuda race, it may not be available for our race. Um, so we do compete. Uh, it's, a, it's an inventory issue, not really a, um, that we're at the same time. Uh, but these are just some of the, the different uh, companies that we've used in the past. We have a relationship with Bermuda Rentals. They've been helping our racers find properties from as early as I was involved with the race in 2010. They, uh, <clears throat> they have rentals that aren't necessarily listed on their website. So if you're looking for an accommodation in a specific area or you have, you know, you have nine people and you need to find the right place, you can contact uh, the person there and uh, she will work with you in trying to find the right uh, accommodation for your crew. Now, there is a third option if you don't want to <clears throat> go through Bermuda Rentals or Airbnb, VBRO, um, you can stay on your boat. And a lot of people do that. Um, a lot of people will race down and stay on the boat. My experience has been that's not a very pleasant experience because, you know, you want to get off the boat, get a shower, not get back on the boat for at least a day or two. Um, but it is an affordable way to, uh, it's less expensive. Uh, people who don't have been to Bermuda before don't realize that there aren't a huge, there aren't a lot of hotels and the hotels are very, very expensive. So I went ahead and gave you these, these options, uh, these uh, ideas here. And the, and the closest parishes to the club are also important. Um, if you book a property, if you book accommodations outside of these three, it's, it's a hike. It's going to, you're going to spend a lot of money in taxi, in, in, on taxis. Uh, and it looks like a little island, but it can take you an hour by taxi to go from one side of the island. If you're over in St. Tom or in, um, if you're over in um, St. George, it could take an hour before you get over just to get to the club. And the last thing you want to do is be spending $50 every time you want to, want to go back to wherever you're staying. So just something to think about. Oops, what happened there? I'm sorry about that. And finally, just a little bit about contingency planning as you're prepping for the race. What will you do if? And I just listed, these are things that have actually happened on boats where, uh, when I've been doing offshore races. Um, and it can, it, many times you think, oh, we've got everything covered. Um, but then, you know, the food spoils. Well, did you bring any, any you know, uh, MRE type of, of dehydrated food? as a backup. Uh, what are you going to do if the crew is, is seasick or uh, the, the last uh, Annapolis to Newport race was a really rough race. And that's something that I think, you know, many people didn't expect and it caused a lot of issues. So you got to think in terms of like, what are we going to do if we don't have the, you know, the perfect race with the perfect wind and everybody is fine and nothing bad happens. Um, so those are, so just sort of the ideas that I came to this um, seminar with tonight to share with you. Um, hopefully if you have any questions, uh, Don is my safety guru, but if you have any questions outside of safety, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I'll be answering questions at the end of this uh, presentation as well. Uh, let's see, Don, are you ready to, to talk a little bit more about safety? I am. I am. Great. Well, just give me a second here and I will uh, change the... Just a moment. Let me stop my video too. I will change the presenter to you. Okay. Let me see. 
There you go. All right. Let me go ahead and share screen here. And you should be seeing my screen now, is that right? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Well, good evening, folks. Uh, as uh, Corinne said, I'm Don Snowgrove. I'll be the, the safety lead for the A to B 2022. And I'm looking very much forward to going through some of the some of the details with respect to the safety requirements. So there's a few key items to keep in mind is that we have um, special, specific safety requirements that we create, but they're very, very similar to the ones that come out from the US sailing uh, special equipment regulations. And you'll see the website address for the ones that were just released about a month ago um, from uh, 2021 for the U.S. Uh, Sailing Organization for Offshore Safety Information. That's the light blue URL that's down at the bottom. And Corinne, I would assume that we're going to be providing, you know, this briefing for folks so they can, they don't have to write down, uh, you know, 35 letters and slashes. <laughs> um, yes, yes. We will put those on our website so that people can get them uh, from the, the Annapolis to Bermuda Ocean Rays <coughs> website. Great. Um, the, the regulations that pertain to the ADB, as it says here in the slide, it's a modified version, and that modified version in general means that we're not quite as stringent as the ones that come up that are recommended from the U.S. Sailing Organization. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the differences. There are, are not many, and if you were to go ahead and download the 2021 uh, regulations as they exist, you'll find that that is a very good foundation for anything that you're likely to want to do with respect to a checklist. Um, but let's go through a little bit uh, as we talk about here. I, as Corinne said, the time to go ahead and look at these safety regulations is really in the next four to five months. You know, once you get the tarp off your boat, if your boat's on the hard right now, it's not bad to go through it. There's, it looks a little bit daunting at first when you see dozens and dozens of requirements but you'll find that many of them are met from any given production boat. There's very, there's very few production boats that are meant that don't have some of the basic uh, foundations in terms of how well your cockpit drains to um, how tall your lifelines are to, uh, you know, the fact that you've got a propane tank that's safe to be used to uh, those kind of things. You'll find you'll be able to check off a number of these pretty quickly. But it's the ones that aren't necessarily things that you've got in your boat. And we'll talk more about these here in a few slides that are ones that you'd want to look at that will require some time and effort on your part to go ahead and comply. Um, and that's, that's in essence what you do is you'll make a schedule or, you know, a checklist of how you can get some of these, these items done. Once they're done, and now we're talking, you know, next spring in pretty much April of 2022, you'll go ahead and schedule an inspection with the A to B race committee. And you will have your boat physically inspected by one of our inspectors or possibly two folks that will go out to where your boat is. It doesn't have to be in Annapolis. If it's somewhere in the general local area, if you're down in Deal or you're up in Baltimore or something along those lines, <coughs> certainly, you know, we'll come to you. If your boat is further away, it's up in New England, then we may have to obviously do the inspection, you know, when you get down in this area. But you need to give yourself time, one, to not only get here, and two, to have the inspection done, but you want to be able to give yourself a little time to correct any non-compliant options that you may have. You do have the option, in some cases, of getting a waiver, you know, that the race committee can provide you. But that's not done lightly. And it's not done on a regular basis. And there's got to be a pretty good reason. Um, it has been done. I, I won't say that it, it can't be done. But if you know that you've got something that you're not going to be compliant with, and you should know that certainly months ahead of time um, as, you, uh, as you work through your checklist of, of the various items, you want to talk to me and the race committee and make us aware of the issue that you've got. And so that you're not uh, blindsided when, you know, the waiver doesn't get approved at the last minute. Um, but it will get, hopefully, all inspected. Any non-compliant uh, items can be corrected, you know, sometimes on the spot or sometimes, you know, within a few days. And we can come back and relook at your boat. 
but you'll have a, a signed off inspection that will allow you to, you know, obviously enter the race and, 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 and have a good time. Um, the liability, as you see down here at the bottom, re remains with the boat owner. It's not uh, the A to B race committee that, you know, incurs any liability for, you know, whether your uh, upgrades to your boat, you know, were successful or not. Uh, one of the things that you'll talk about you know, in the in this presentation just quickly is stability index. You know, it's the ability of your boat to, in essence, withstand a rolling moment of some sort that might cause it to capsize. Um, this is one where the U.S. sailing ocean limit for offshore uh, abilities is, is 110. Currently, this is where, again, we're, we're not always complying with them. We do not have a specific limit, or we have certainly not in any of our, our past races, and I don't see that changing as of right now. But it's something you should know. You should know what the stability index is for your vessel. And certainly if it's something that's below 110, you should consider why that vessel, you know, why your vessel's got a rating that low. What's causing that? Because it, it is something, of course, that you want to make sure that you're safe with. You know, I'm sure many of you have heard about the Chicago to Mackinac race back a, a few years ago where there was a a boat out there with a stability index that, you know, had some serious issues to include, you know, uh, a fatality on the boat. Uh, we're not going to go through, uh, you know, uh, trigonometry here and uh, figure out what it is, but in essence, what you're talking about a 110 stability index is, is uh, you know, uh, where where the, the boat will go over like 100 20 degrees, I'm not going to go through all this, I'll, I'll, I'll let you folks, if, you, if you're interested in knowing more, feel free to contact me or, and or, or look it up, but um, we'll go on from there. <laughs> um, rigging inspection is pretty important. I wouldn't get that two months ahead of time, you know, especially if you haven't, um, you should be inspecting your rig every year anyway, certainly in the spring. Um, certain key things such as keel bolts, that's really not part of your rigging, but it's very important or um, you know, where the bulkheads come in, um, your, the stainless steel shrouds that you have. Uh, I recommend that you either do a thorough study and spend a few hours you know, in a bosun's chair to inspect it yourself, or you can certainly hire one of the professional rigging companies in your local area. You know, generally speaking, you know, most boats will have their uh, standing rigging replaced every 15 to 20 years. I know on my boat, I had it replaced at the 18 year point before uh, we took it uh, across the Atlantic and it gave me a lot of peace of mind, even though, you know, we didn't find any serious, serious problems. Some of the problems that can incur are not necessarily ones that you can see right offhand. Um, structural bulkheads and tabbing, you know, these, I'm not gonna go through, you know, how to do all of these inspections but I highly recommend that you go through your boat from stem to stern. It, it gives you a good chance to not only look at your boat as well as the conditions of the deck and the keel bolts and uh, how, how your bulkheads are doing. It also hopefully gives you an opportunity to take a few things off the boat that you didn't even know were there that uh, will help lighten the boat and give you more space for the kind of things that you will wanna take on the, on the offshore trip. Um, there is a requirement that you know the, the crew have 500 miles and that's just as much for the boat as it really is for the crew. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more of this, but what I highly recommend is once you've got your crew identified, you know, and as Corinne said, that's probably done in you know, the late fall or early winter of 2022, is have a, a sea trial that lasts a couple days, a couple days and a full night and go out with the as many of the crew members as you can. Generally, we do ours the first weekend in May, and we do this every year, regardless of whether we're doing A to B. You know, it's it's important for both the crew as well as the boat to to get broken in. And doing it in early May gives you six to eight weeks before the actual race, and that gives you the opportunity to fix things um, that you know that you will be surprised if you haven't done a sea trial on your boat in a few years. I guarantee that you will come back with a list of at least half a dozen things that need to be repaired or replaced or uh, maybe issues with your crew, you know, where, you know, person A doesn't get along well with person B. Well, what do we do? We can just keep them on separate watches. Do we need to replace person A? 
you know, uh, how, do, how do we uh, deal with crew compatibility as much as the safety of the boat? Let's see, thought I hit a button. Let's try it again. Hmm. Okay, Let's click the mouse. Uh, sails, now, some of these have changed in the last few years. A storm tri-sail is no longer required. Um, it's recommended, but you don't have to do it. Um, one reef point on a main, I highly recommend you have two. Personally, I, the third reef point is one that we use fairly regularly when we get true winds that are over 20, 22 knots. Our boat just gets become, it becomes over canvas. But you need to make sure that the sails are in, in good condition. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more on an upcoming slide here as well. But, um, and it's not like you've got to you know, have these sails manufactured, especially when you talk about a storm jib or a heavy weather spinnaker, if you decide to use it, there's places where you can get these sales, you know, pretty discounted. Certainly, <coughs> excuse me, in the local area, bacon sales is, that's where we went. I bought a storm tri-sail, a storm jib, and a heavy weather spinnaker from them all in the span of just a few weeks. And they've been in, they've been great sales. One of the things about buying storm sales is they're almost always in pristine condition. So you're, some, you're buying it used, but, it's probably only had about four hours on it, if that. Most of the cases, um, you can get some pretty good deals on, on used storm sails. Uh, this is uh, down at the bottom. You can see there's a working jib and a storm jib. Uh, the picture that you see there is uh, one of the Navy 44s. They've got up a storm trisail there off the mast, and that is their storm jib that they're uh, using up on the, up on the bow. And when we do our sea trial, uh, we go out and we rig all of these sails. Uh, and one of the things that comes, that's is actually sort of surprising to me is, you know, you, you, there's, these are small sails, but even in eight to 10 knots of wind, which is normally what we have in a sea trial, they move the boat along surprisingly well. Uh, I thought we would just sit there and be going a half a knot or so, but the, these storm sails, again, if you learn how to properly trim them and they're properly rigged, um, actually do work pretty well, and it doesn't have to be 40 knots win. Uh, a good number one Genoa, if we live in the Chesapeake Bay, we know how important a good number one Genoa is. Um, you know, you're going to use that um, a good deal of the time under normal conditions that we experience, you know, in a June Bermuda race. And of course, a spinnaker, if you're in a spinnaker division, whether it's an ASIM or a symmetric, it's, it's a key item on your boat. Often an A to B race, since we're going southeast, you, you often end up with at least a few days of a broad reach uh, to where you know, you're going to be running a spinnaker. And it's, it's, a, it's an important sail if you're in that kind of a division. Uh, this, this is a list of a number of things. They're all on the safety equipment uh, regulations, the SERs. And you, I won't go through all of those, but this is the kind of thing where you would want to see how well you're doing. Some of these, some of these things are pretty easy to, to fix, like, you know, through hulls. Well, they've got to be able to be turned. And you want a wood, you know, backup stopper, you know, uh, that you can plug into the seacock if, if necessary. Um, that's, that's pretty simple to fix, hopefully, as well as to purchase, you know, these wood, you know, uh, seacock backups, you know, these wood cork plugs. Um, other things that, uh, that may be a little harder and you want to make sure is, is how is your companionway designed? You know, are, are the hatchboards, you know, uh, lockable to the boat, you know, or not to where they're locked, but to where they won't float away? Um, water tanks, how well are your water tanks stabilized and will they remain in position, you know, in uh, 12 foot seas? You can go through all of these items. Uh, they're, they're all very well specified in the SERs as to uh, what you have, what, what you're required. One thing down at the bottom, it talks about, you'll see in the bottom right, there's a mast heel. You're required that the mast will not come out of the boat if, uh, if you capsize. And generally that, that uh, situation is alleviated by simply putting a bolt that uh, is drilled through the base of the mast if you've got like a keel step mast. And it's, it's pretty straightforward to, uh, to do. But again, you want to make sure uh, you either you do it, or in my case, I wasn't really sure exactly how to do it, so I had it rigged with that. 
Uh, that's what it's like, folks. Every day is just like this, you know, blue skies, three foot seas, beam reach as you go to Bermuda. Okay, well, maybe not every day, but there certainly are going to be a few days like that in, in each trip. It's a, it's a, it's a unique experience. And as, as Corinne said, you know, if it's not on your bucket list, it should be. And if you're here listening to this briefing, then hopefully it is on your bucket list. Uh, you'll see in this slide, if you look down, you've got to have attachment points for two thirds of your crew so that their tethers um, can be you know, secured to the boat. Um, there's a number of ways to do this. In this case, you can see they put line through some of the corner eyes and you can hook up to any part of that you know, uh, pink or lime green line and, and lock in. The key thing is, is as you come up the companionway steps from down below, you want to be able to tether in before you're out in the cockpit. And that's, that's the key thing. Um, in most cases, this can be done pretty easily by, you know, just securing a few eye bolts and then running a Dyneema or some, some other line through them. Uh, the care and feeding of the crew. Um, you need buckets. There's always two buckets and buckets always come in handy. Um, that's one of the requirements. Uh, you've got to obviously have bunks sufficient to accommodate the off-watch crew. With us, we race with eight. We have a 39-foot sloop. We have four on watch and four off watch. So, you know, most, most of the issues aren't going to be around here. But I would say this, it's not so much that you've got bunks sufficient to accommodate the crew, it is you have bunks where sleeping can be accomplished that will are sufficient in number to accommodate the off watch crew. The V berth is not a great spot, as you might imagine, you know, when the, you're close hauled, you know, in uh, six foot seas. And uh, generally what we do, and you can see it on this picture here, you can see where a lee cloth has been uh, secured on the left side there in blue to make, you know, the, the mid, mid cabin, uh, you know, compatible for various degrees of heel. And that's generally what we do is we'll put two people in the mid cabin there on the, uh, the, the settees. And then we'll have two in our uh, aft stateroom. And we put a leap cloth up in the aft stateroom so that it divides it so you don't have two people rolling into each other, you know, when you're hard over on starboard. Um, other things pretty much are pretty squared away. People almost always have, you, you've got to have a fuel shut off if you're going to be ABYC compliant. So you're going to have that, um, a water tank and delivery system. You will also carry a gallon of water for every person on board the boat is a, in a backup or emergency uh, rations. Generally what we do is we get like, you know, a two gallon or a five gallon uh, container from, uh, well, what we actually did is we bought a five gallon potable, uh, you know, plastic container that was heavy plastic and then use that um, for five of the gallons. And then we had another one with, that had three gallons in it. So we had a total of eight gallons. What we did the first year and it did not work out well is we bought, oh, we'll get these one gallon plastic uh, cans from the supermarket and we'll just store them, you know, in the nav station seat, you know, underneath the nav station seat. Well, they started leaking after about one day because of all the rubbing and the friction and it's such thin plastic. You know, I went down to get one, you know, about three days after we came back from the race because uh, we didn't need them for the race, fortunately. And, you know, two out of the three were empty. And that explained why I found water in the bilge and I didn't know why. Well, that was, that was a lesson learned. Um, the through hall layouts, in fact, what you're seeing here is just an indication. If you don't have this already done for your boat, this is a great opportunity for you to do it and is to note where all the seacock locations are in the boat. Um, what we'll do is also we'll put in the locations of the fire extinguishers. We'll put in where the EPIRB is. And you'll see that here on this, this other slide. You can see where the fire extinguishers have been uh, put in. I highly recommend you do it, even if you're not going to do the A to B race. And we keep this, you know, plasticized right by the galley as you come down the companionway. And it shows you where everything is on the boat pretty much that you're going to need. Uh, this is another discussion of where that it talks in here about crystal fine china. I'm not sure who really is bringing crystal fine china on their boat. Maybe that was done. I didn't create this slide. Maybe that was done a little bit as a, as a joke. <laughs> uh, bilge pumps. This is 
something that often is not done on boats. Certainly it wasn't on our boat when we first started doing this. You know, it talks about uh, the, you've got a permanently outside manual bilge pump. That comes pretty much standard on every production boat. Um, you've also got an electric bilge pump that you've got, you know, that comes pretty much standard on the boat. What they do require is what you see over here in the red on the right, which is a second permanently installed manual bilge pump that can pump 10 gallons per minute that's operable from below deck. So this, this in essence is sort of like the one that you've got above deck often, you know, by the helm, but it's completely independent of that and it's operated from below deck. In our case, what we did is we secured one uh, under, there's a lot of different ways that I've seen this done, but in our case, um, we secured it uh, underneath the aft stateroom uh, bunk boards um, where there was space behind the batteries and you have the handle with it and you, you can hook it up a number of different ways. It, in essence, it's got to, you know, it can't go, um, uh, you know, you've got to have obviously an exhaust on it and you can hook that up. Maybe it, you can wide into an existing one or you can uh, secure it other ways. If you've got questions about this, feel free to, you know, ask questions in, uh, at a later time if you want. But there's, it's doable and the, the pumps are not that expensive. Uh, mass base attachment, you can see the bolt here that secures the mass to make sure it doesn't come out. And boat systems. Well, these are a lot of batteries here. Maybe more batteries than you're going to probably always want on your uh, on your own vessel. But you do want to make sure that your batteries are up. One of the up to speed on this. One of the things that you find is uh, if you aren't using your boat on a sustained basis for five to six days, where let's say the engine's normally not running or you're not hooking up to marine power or whatever else you'll quickly find out that the conditions of your battery isn't necessarily what you expect. If you start out with 12.7 volts with the batteries fully charged, and after, let's say, a, a half a day of sea trial, your, your vessel's batteries are down to 12.0, then one of two things is happening. You're burning a lot more power than you think you are. There's a lot more amps you know, that are being used than you may be aware of, or your batteries just don't... Um, can't, can't withstand it and they're, they're, uh, they're tired and they likely need to be replaced. Uh, you can go with lithium, you can do with AGM. There's no requirement as to the kind of batteries that you have. That's certainly up to you. Uh, but the C trial, again, if you're all day and all night and all day, you'll get a good feel with all the wear and tear of having the chart plotters on 24 seven and the lights at night and the water pressure pump going, and maybe the radar's on every now, you'll get a quick feel after a sea trial as to whether or not your batteries are in good shape. The last thing you wanna have to do is run the engine two and a half hours a day to try and put power into a system that if the batteries were in good condition, uh, that you shouldn't be running it more than an hour a day. Uh, Corinne talked about your chart plotter system. I highly recommend that you be very familiar with your chart plotter uh, well before you know you uh, you get on this trip, and the steering uh, again. If the boat's on the hard, check everything about it. Make sure there's not a lot of play in the steering. That the rudder is good. That the bearings are fine. That you don't have a lot of left and right play in the rudder as well. Secure all the heavy items, whether that's anchors or batteries or whatever. You want to make sure that they don't come up and uproot themselves, you know, in a strong heel or, you know, in a capsized situation. Okay, that's not a really good looking oil filter. And uh, I think most of this is basic work. Uh, the one thing that you probably aren't necessarily doing when you do your engine maintenance is check the condition of your fuel. Uh, you know, a lot of times if you're just in the bay, that fuel doesn't really get uh, jumbled up a lot. That's not necessarily the case when you get out there in larger seas and the sediment or other dirt that you might have in the fuel tank can quickly clog up a fuel filter. This is the kind of thing you wanna check before you get out there and you're 250 miles offshore. You know, you could have the fuel polished, you could empty the fuel, clean the tank and then put it back in. There's a number of things to do, uh, but I, I highly recommend you make sure that your fuel tank's in good condition too. 
Wow, lots of items. This is all listed, you know, in uh, in the SERs, uh, and I won't go through all of these items. I will pull out just a few that I think are important. Um, uh, Aperb, if you know, you can rent one or you can buy one. The price on them was uh, they come down a little bit, but they're still, you know, probably anywhere from four hundred fifty to six hundred dollars for a full you know, full EPIRB, I'm not talking a POB, a full EPIRB that has 48 hours worth of battery life. Uh, uh, you wanna make sure that if you're renting one that you go online with uh, the Coast Guard and put in the appropriate information for that so that when that EPIRB goes off, they know it's it's your boat and not not the, the previous renter of that EPIRB. Um, grab bag, there's a lot of items. There's not requirements specifically about what you put in a grab bag. That's the one bag that goes with you if you have to, you know, go into the life raft. But there's some great articles and ideas about the kind of things that you would want to put in, in the grab bag. Two things I would highlight that are very important to put in. One is everybody on the boat should give you, the skipper, the passports. And those passports should go in the grab bag before the boat leaves the dock. The second thing is any medicines that any of the people on the crew are going to need for let's say us, you know, more than 12 or 24 hours or whatever out, you know, in a life raft, you wanna make sure that they bring some extra medicines that they can give you and put into the grab bag. And you do that before you leave the dock as well. PFDs, the specifics are all on the SERs. Uh, I, you know, you're gonna want um, a durable one. I highly recommend a PFD that has a built-in harness and, uh, the tethers, there's different uh, types of tethers. You can see one down here has got the two, two hooks on it. Um, some races are requiring now, the Halifax race now requires that your tether have, a, have two hooks on it, one at the three foot length and one at the six foot length. We have not required that for A to B. I don't see that changing right now, but certainly everybody has to have their own individual tether, harness, PFD, and the PFDs come with both a light and a whistle, an automatic light and a whistle should be in there. Man overboard, there's uh, a few ways to do it. A lot of people use the man overboard module eight, the MOM eight. You can see that over there on the right side of the screen right there. It's pretty much a all in one device. You know, it comes in a fiberglass canister. You just pull a pin and the, the, the whole system deploys. Um, out into the water. It's not tethered to the boat. It goes hopefully with the person that's just fallen overboard uh, and, uh, you know, provides you with a light, a horse collar, um, and the lights on top of a six foot long inflated uh, pole. And uh, it, I've never had it deployed at night, you know, uh, and that's probably a good thing. But uh, you definitely, there's other ways to do it besides a mom eight, but uh, the mom eights I think are, are an excellent way. Of, uh, of doing it and you secure it to your your taft rail your taft rail there on the back of the boat uh, most people rent life rafts you don't have to you can certainly go out and purchase it it's got to obviously be large enough for you know whether you're a six-man crew or your eight-man crew uh, i can tell you a couple things about this if you are going to rent there just as as corinne is talking about you know you want to let's say if you're going to get a place in Bermuda that you're gonna stay at, you wanna do that a few months ahead of time. Life's rafts are probably even more so. Um, is depending upon whether you're looking for one that's in a soft valise or a hard fiberglass cover and whether it's six man or eight man, uh, I would I would reserve Sorry, it. I couldn't hear what you said. I'm not sure why my watch is going off. Uh, I would reserve it in August or September of the prior year. There's uh, one good place to get it and they've got um, uh, life rafts that are well, well certified and I've been quite impressed with them is Vane Brothers, V-A-N-E. Um, they repack life rafts. They're also a tug service up in Baltimore. So it's not too far a uh, drive uh, to, to go up there and you generally rent it for, you know, the month of June or something along those lines for, uh, it's around $500, I think was the last time I paid. Um, that's one thing you can do if you're going to, if you know you're going to be doing more sustained races, then I would purchase one and you can do that. Often you can get pretty good deals at the, the fall boat show, um, you know, from, there's a number of vendors that, that put them out, but 
don't wait until the last minute to get a life raft because they, they don't have that many that they rent out. You could end up having to rent it from the West Coast and now you've got shipping and you just don't want to get involved with that. And if you're going to borrow a friend's life raft, make sure you personally check on when that life raft needs to be repacked. You know, if he hands it to you, you know, uh, three, three weeks before the race and it was due for a repack in 2018, that's not going to hack it. You have to show that the life raft is, has been repacked within the stated dates. And that's generally anywhere from, that's four years, five years, depends on the raft. But um, don't wait till the last minute on this. This is one of the real long lead items. Uh, this is a little bit of a ditch bag, but this is just what we talked about. Emergency steering, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you don't have to have a spare rudder. You have to have a way that you've tested that allows you to steer the boat if there were no rudder on board. We're not talking about a backup tiller, you know, where you don't use the helm, but you use, let's say, a rod that connects directly to the rudder. That's required too. This is if the rudder falls off the boat and how do you steer the boat then? Um, one of the, they mentioned here that drogue, a drogue chute that you drag behind the boat with lines that come up both the port and the starboard side uh, and differential pulling on those, you secure those lines to winches both on the port and starboard side. And as you uh, tighten one up and loosen the other, that drogue moves left and right behind the boat and it provides differential thrust I guess I would call it thrust, differential drag that allows the boat to steer. Uh, it's not always easy to do this. You need to check this and you'll find that sail pressure is just as important, you know, as to whether or not you're easing a main or easing a jib to help that steering goes on. But it does work, but it's not something that you want to just say, well, I got the equipment, I've got the drogue, I'm sure, hey, we're not going to, this is something you test on the sea trial too. Spend spend an hour or two and figure out whether or not it can be done, both under sail as well as under power, and get a feel for um, the difficulties that you might have in in you know putting this out in the water in what could not be necessarily you know calm conditions. Talked about the life raft, the EPIRB, the ditch bag. Um, it uh, it's they're all great things, and I would put them out and have them in your sea trial, you know, and and see, let the crew see all of these things. Let them see what's in the ditch bag. Have a person assigned to take that ditch bag. You know, um, they, you wanna make sure that these things don't get left behind. Uh, satellite phone is required. Um, there's a number of ways to to do this and we won't go into all the, all the details. A lot of people will use an Iridium Go that they will rent and uh, the Iridium Go acts not only as a satellite phone, it, you connect it to your smartphone that you have on board, but it also acts as a downloadable conduit to get grid files, weather files, and that uh, type of information. And so it serves really two purposes uh, and allows you to get those, those weather files while you're offshore. Um, uh, you do not need an SSB. There is no requirement for a single sideband, you know, uh, HF type radio, but you do have to carry an HF receiving radio. That's, you know, about a 30 or $40 purchase. It's not too much, but it allows you to pick up on various uh, weather frequencies on the FM band or HF band. Uh, everybody's got GPSs. Um, you make, you know, they're on just about everybody's phone nowadays. Your chart plotter has to have an MOB feature. I don't know of chart plotters that are made nowadays that don't have that. But what I would do, again, this goes into your, your practice, your sea trial, is learn how the feature works. It's different on different uh, vessels. And uh, I know, and this, this happened, I think, actually in the Bermuda, was it the, uh, let's see, it was, no, it was, uh, was it? I think it was in the Volvo Ocean Race, the most recent time where they had a man go overboard and the person on the helm hit the MOB button, but didn't hold it down for the required three seconds. And so it wasn't activated until later in the, in the, in the mishap. So practice this and know how to reset it as well. 
it's a, it's a key thing and it's, it's a very valuable thing. Currently AIS is not recommended or not, <laughs> no, it's not required, but it is recommended. It's possible that we might change that ruling over the next year or so. I, I don't foresee it. Um, I, it is a wonderful feature. Um, and I'm sure many of you are already have it on your boats, both receive as well as transmit. Um, but, uh, it's not required on A to B as of this time. Uh, paper charts, there's a list of paper charts that are required. Um, and I won't go through those, but uh, you know, they're pretty much deal with uh, Bermuda. Uh, I would highly study, the paper charts give you a much better feeling for the approaches to Bermuda and some of the challenges are. Bermuda is you know, virtually surrounded on almost 360 degrees. Um, I, maybe 270 by uh, coral reefs. And, and so you don't enter Bermuda lightly if you don't know exactly where you're going. Uh, race routing software, as it says here, is um, allowed. You um, just can't have outside assistance, you know, where someone is telling you this is the best way to go. You have to use the routing software. You can download weather to the boat and then the routing software can be updated and used on your boat to determine the optimal route. Um, I would identify the positions of the people. Kryn talked a little bit about, you know, having CPR people, uh, you know, having a certain number of people with uh, first aid CPR uh, capabilities. This is your medical officer, you know, identify well ahead of time who you want for your watch captains, um, who's going to be your navigator, um, you know, cook, it doesn't have to be a cook, you may rotate it amongst, you know, four people. What we generally did is every day on our watch, um, certain people would be assigned certain jobs. We, we didn't have a designated cook. I wish we had, but we would alternate, you know, cooks through the five, six, or seven days of the race. And everybody would have a different job each day. One person to be in charge of keeping the head clean. One person would be in charge of making sure that uh, water and fuel looked fine. One person would be in charge of, uh, you know, washing the dishes while another person would dry. I mean, we we brought it down to that level because if everybody knows what they're going to do, they're going to do it. Um, if, if, if things get messy and, you know, there's no organization on board, morale gets down. You want a happy, happy crew as a crew that knows what they're supposed to do and, and keep the boat looking ship shape. Uh, boy, this goes into the sea trial with the MOB drills. Um, Lifecraft procedures, you can't really fully simulate all of that, uh, but I highly recommend that wherever you're going to stow your life raft, these things weigh a lot more than you might think they are. The eight-man life raft that uh, we have on board is really a two-man lift. Well, who are the two people that you're going to have pull that out? Um, and where, how are they going to get it over the side? And where are they going to secure the tether on that life raft to the boat? These are things that you want to practice, you know, in your sea trials. The same as we talked about with the emergency steering and the storm sails. Uh, this is the bridle that we discussed a little bit earlier, you know, and how you can use the, the differential drag to, to turn the boat. But as I mentioned, you've got to use sail pressure too. Um, that, that really, really can help. And Corinne. Well, that is uh, what we had for our presentation tonight, but we'd like to open it up for questions now. If anyone had any questions about uh, what, uh, what I've presented or what Don's presented, please speak up. We'd like to answer your questions. Can you hear me? Yes, Mike, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, is there availability of fine crew that has done the cruise? Yes, yes. Uh, we have uh, a crew board that will open up uh, at when uh, June 1st is when entries will open. That is also when we will be publishing the NOR and the crew board will also become available on the Annapolis to Bermuda website. So you'll be able to go to our website, go onto the crew board and yacht scoring and you can post uh, to the crew board that you're looking for crew. So. Yeah you find that they've been experienced and have done it before or most of the crew or are they novice looking to join a boat? Um, 
all, yes, yes, you'll get, there will be people on that crew board who have never done it before, people who just want to do a delivery back. Uh, you'll also have people who are, you know, have, have a lot of experience. You can get someone who's older and has had many, many years experience. You can get the young guys who, you know, just graduated from College of Charleston and want a little bit more offshore experience. Um, it's really a lot of different things. One of the things that helps uh, skippers a lot is uh, beginning in the fall, we will be having some happy hours at, at EYC. And we invite skippers to this happy hour. Many of the people who post on the crew board will also come. That's sort of a mixer. It's a great opportunity to meet the people you've been maybe talking to or get those people out on your boat with you. Excellent, thank you. Another question, if you don't mind. Um, so yes, you have to return. Do they, most crew come back together and do they have some sort of guidance schedule or on a return trip? Um, the most boats don't have the same crew for the race that they have the, for the return. You know, many people can't take that amount of time off work or they just want to do the race or they just want to do the return. Uh, so you're going to, you're really looking at two different groups of people. Um, and as far as guidance goes with leaving Bermuda and, and coming back, most of the boats will leave the Monday after we, we have a, uh, most of us get in Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then we have the award ceremony Saturday. People rest and relax on Sunday, and most boats leave on Monday. Um, and there usually is a group of boats that will try to coordinate coming back sort of in company. Mm -hmm. So you, you will have other boats somewhat around you to, uh, in case you run into trouble. I understand. This is a uh, Coast Guard Greg. I accidentally muted myself. Um, there's a great amount of community that happens with the, the uh, A to B skippers. Uh, even though you are competing against each other, there's a lot of camaraderie that happens. And um, it, especially once everybody gets to Bermuda, that it's, you know, everybody's telling sea stories and uh, they're really bonding. So your, your chances of getting to know the other skippers and going, going back in company is, is very good. Nice. Uh, this is Greg. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Uh, hi, good evening. Coast Guard Greg, uh, echo Mike's uh, question. And uh, the interim between now and I guess we're talking summer of 2022. Um, I'm retired Coast Guard chopper pilot. Uh, by trade, but I've been sailing for 22 years on my and raced my own 30-footer. Uh, I've raced a uh, boat rushing boat from Antigua to Bermuda. So you're right, this is kind of a bucket list. I only heard the audio. I was biking here in uh, the Bahamas. But if anybody's doing anything epic in between now and then, um, I'm looking for the Transpac uh, this summer. And currently cruising the Bahamas, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a boat from Aruba to. La Paz, Baja style. So I'm going to be out there and beating the docks since the crew boards. I mean, I don't know. I guess that's tough for uh, for skippers to choose, let alone for uh, for us crew to get picked. So um, electronic technician, scuba dive instructor, emergency first responder, French toast maker. Let's go fast and let's do it safe. Giddy up. Greg Gettimer. Google it, please. Thanks, Greg. Out. My pleasure. Do we have any other questions on the presentation? Um, I've got a question. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Bar Johansson. Uh, what is the deadline for completing the inspection and what is the earliest date that you can have the inspection performed? Don? Um, you know, we don't have like an earliest date. I generally, I, the, the vast majority of the inspections occur in April to early May. Um, I don't see why we couldn't do it earlier than that. You know, you get into the winter months uh, a little bit, you know, prior to that, but I don't see any reason why it couldn't be done, you know, maybe in, in the March time frame or so. I don't know if I'd want to do it, you know, the previous fall because it's just too, too far before the race and too many things could possibly happen or change to the boat, you know, over the winter time. Um, the, the latest I would probably schedule to have the boat 
inspected would be no later than probably the 10th of May. Uh, that gives enough time for the inspection to occur and gives a, hopefully the owner enough time to, you know, reconcile any, any issues that might have come up. There's also a little bit of a time uh, issue with you're going to, you're going to want your life raft. You're going to need your EPIRB. Um, and there's, there are some, some, en there's some entries data that uh, specifically with the EPIRB that has to be registered with Bermuda. So we generally try to get all that paperwork to Bermuda with at the latest a week before the race. Um, well, one thing that I didn't state is that there's no requirement that you have your satellite phone or your uh, life raft and EPIRB on the boat at the time of inspection. We understand a lot of people right, rent right. those things and they're not going to be available, you know, in April or early May. Um, right. But what you will be required to do is when you finally check in, you know, prior to the race and get your items is to show, you know, the, the fact that you do have those items and, and we'll get the SAT phone number from you and we'll obviously check the uh, currency dates on, on the, the life raft and that kind of thing. And, and do the safety... Uh, do, do the safety requirements get into the details of like catamaran specific requirements? I'm thinking like manual bilge pumps, you know, do you have to have one per hull or can you have a portable unit that goes below? Uh, I need to, I have not inspected catamaran. So and, and I guess along the same lines in terms of rudders, you know, we'd still have one rudder yeah. and one right. engine or two engines and no, that, that, I, that's a good question. We'll get a, a more cohesive answer back to you on that. I know that uh, U.S. Safety has safety uh, equipment regulations for monohulls as well as multi-hulls, and I'm sure they address some of the questions that you're talking about. I just don't know what the answers are right now. I need to become more fam familiar on that myself. As, as Karen says, you know, we've, we've got multi-hulls going on this race. I just need to understand a little bit better what some of the subtle differences are between uh, what the requirements are for rudders and bilge pumps and that kind of thing. And yeah, in my case, that. yeah, in my case, I, I want to get my boat up from the Caribbean in May time frame. It's just, can I get it inspected in, in time to get into the race? I would say yes. You know, yeah. if, if you're going to be up certainly by early May, that's, that's the best. Yeah. Um, but yes, you, we, we should be able to make that work. Okay. This is uh, Mike Lemkul. As a former inspector, I know we've had issues in the past where people have been coming in from out of town. And if there is going to be a time crunch, if you alert us in time, we can make arrangements so that uh, we can accommodate you. Um, where we've had, you know, uh, inspections done uh, elsewhere, uh, if you're out of state, as long as you're getting here within a few days before the race where we can do a, a very quick check. But uh, uh, it, the, the key is to let us know ahead of time mm -hmm. if there's gonna be an issue. Did we have any other questions? Anyone else wanted, have anything that they needed to add? Yeah, uh, this is Roger Lant. Hello. Um, I have a question with regard to boat registration. Um, being a non-U.S. national, but having a boat in the U.S., I can't register it with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, do you know if that's a requirement to enter Bermuda? Uh, you are registered with the U.S. Coast Guard or no? Uh, no, I can't. As a non-U.S. national, I can't register the boat with the Coast Guard. Okay. Um, I know that there are boats that do the other races that are not U.S. Coast Guard registered boats. So my, I, and I can do more research on this, but I know there are boats that are non-U.S. registered boats uh, that do the Newport to Bermuda uh, race. So I would say that that should not be a problem. But are they registered to another another country? Yes, yes, they are registered to another country. Yeah, Roger, this is Mike Glemko. You shouldn't have a problem. I mean, it's, it depends on where the, the the boat is registered. It doesn't depend on where the captain uh, is. Uh, yeah. is uh, 
it, it doesn't, the, the people don't matter. It's all the boat. The so boat you shouldn't have some problem. The, US. the problem is the boat's registered in the U.S., but they can't register it with Coast Guard. Um, yeah. It's not registered internationally. Oh, know. it's not documented. Uh, so you, so it's a state. Uh, uh, it's registered in state, but not documented. I, you right. know, we've had that. I think in the past with some boats. I don't think it's. I don't think it's an issue. Yeah, it doesn't need to be documented. It's, it's fine. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. That makes it easier. Thank you. And I guess the whole assumption is that we're not going to have any COVID quarantine requirements or testing requirements. We're going to be okay when we take off from Annapolis. We certainly hope so. Yeah. We hope that by June 2022, yeah. uh, we won't have that problem. Uh, I've heard some talk about uh, as more people get, get the uh, immunizations that the immunization card will become something that you know, you'll need to have on you if you go to another country. But we, that's, that's just all talk now. So right, we hope that by 2022, we won't be having any uh, COVID issues. I, I will say this, that uh, it's probably easier to get into Bermuda now than uh, most other countries by boat. So uh, certainly by 2022, it won't be an issue. All right. Well, if we didn't have any other questions, um, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight and uh, participating in our first our first uh, Zoom seminar. We are we have another uh, Zoom seminar happening next month, and that one uh, we're going to be putting together a panel of skippers from previous races who will talk about their experiences doing the race, sort of their tips and tricks, things that they would recommend you think about. And uh, you, you'll be, I have an opportunity to ask questions specifically about how they handled um, many of the safety regulations, logistics, uh, that sort of thing. So we hope that you will uh, go ahead and register for the, uh, the March, for the March uh, uh, A to B uh, Zoom seminar. And thank you for coming tonight. I've got a, a quick question for this next Zoom meeting that we're having. Can some one of the previous skippers uh, show us the the approach to Bermuda? Yes, I can. I can ask. I can ask the skippers to include uh, that. Uh, no problem. We haven't. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the scariest part. <laughs> well, here's here's the thing. Twenty miles out, uh, Bermuda Radio is going to be calling you kind of telling you where to go. Now, <laughs> the one thing you'll know if you read through uh, the racing rules from past races, uh, we haven't in the past required you to go around one way or the other. So if you wanted to come from the north and go through the starting line, that's fine. If you want to come through the south and go around the complete other way, have at it. Um, but Bermuda Radio is going to kind of direct you in at some point. And I'll, I'll make sure that the uh, skippers who talk on the panel next month address uh, their navigate some of their navigation um, challenges in approaching Bermuda. Thank you. Sure. And so where is the finish line? Is it by St. George's or up by Hamilton? Uh, it's a, it's St. It's, St. George's, it's off the St. David's Light. Okay. Okay, well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.